Thank you. Wow. So that, that was made in case any of you are regrettably NBC or CB, CBS watchers. <laughs> Just so you can have an idea of who I am before I came up here. Thank you all so much for having me. I have to say, just from sitting in the side room and listening for a while, I feel right at home. The accents make me feel so good. <laughs> I'm from Michigan, so I've worked very hard to get rid of it, but you give me one glass of wine and I'll be right with you. <laughs> all right, it's coming back. Uh, I'm so happy to be here, I really am. Anytime I'm in the Great Lakes, anytime I'm near Lake Michigan at all, even in some sort of proximity, it gives me a sense of calm and real gratitude. And you're gonna hear why in just a moment. But I know that it's very like trendy to talk about gratitude, being grateful, it's all the rage. But of course it's really important. So can we just start everyone right now by just taking one moment and thinking about something that we're grateful for. It can be your nail tech, like I don't care what it is. <laughs> if you could see close, I'd be really grateful if I had a nail tech, it's not good. Real rough. Had to do stuff with the kids yesterday and I didn't get a chance to go. So, but it can be something really big. And that's what I hope that you'll find by the end of this presentation. Because gratitude is trendy and it should stay that way. Because it's part of me, it's part of you, it's why I'm here. I am incredibly grateful to be alive and to be able to be speaking to you all today. So, not just because I've been around and in and before and after most of the biggest tornadoes in the last decade or more, um, many of the hurricanes as well. That last picture was actually a Cat 5 Hurricane Michael back in 2018. This was from Ida down in New Orleans just last year, and then when it moved up and did all that damage around New Jersey, New York. I've been in a lot of water coming up. I've been in a lot of water going down. This is Mobile Bay and something called anti-surge. So the winds pushed the other way and took the water away from Mobile Bay. If you've ever been there, it's a lot of water to move. <laughs> and I was able to walk right out into it. All those tornadoes, the wildfires, the bushfires, even in Australia, I've been able to see a lot of snow. <laughs> a lot. I know you all feel that. Snow. Still part of my job. Um, <laughs> But all of it has been based in something that I grew up loving, and that's science. The science of our atmosphere. And I asked myself quite a bit, how did I get here? How did I get to do this, to find science everywhere? Here I am in front of a church in central Mexico that was at one point, for political reasons, covered with water, an entire village. And in the last 60 years, because of the mega drought they've had developing, you can now walk through it. We were there in the wet season, and that thing has revealed itself again. I was able to find science visiting Lake Powell just last year, about this time, and now we know they're well beyond where we were last year of records, both Lake Mead, Lake Powell, and drought. There's me standing uh, last November on top of a wind turbine. I'm at the very end there. It's about 300 feet up. Not one of the scariest things I've done, oddly. <laughs> I found science by swimming in the Pacific Ocean, that big 400 pound fish, it was a Napoleon wrasse, I believe it's called, it followed me around for like <laughs> two full hours of diving, it was really weird. The science of being in the world's largest cave for one of the first people to be ever in there, to be able to broadcast from there, we were finding new species as we went with the scientists that were with us. Incredible to learn science by swimming with jellyfish who in the last ice age had been separated from the ocean and over the thousands of years didn't have predators so they lost their ability to sting. Certainly science, well I guess it is, when they gave me a piece of PVC pipe and said when the tiger shark comes near just take its nose and move it to the side. I was like, eh, is that what you do? I thought they were like kind of like the catfish of the sea, I don't know. Um, this is science rappelling off of a building in Chicago, because there's physics, gravity, skydiving. Science, for sure, when we were telling the story about vultures and the rapid decline of three different species of vultures in Nepal. I was 
to do this, not going to be able to tell a breakfast GMA story about a bunch of vultures that were dying, because that's not really the thing that you want to do. But there was an ecotourism group that was bringing light to this by allowing people to fly with vultures and have them eat out of their hands. That's what I'm doing there. It's called para-hawking, uh, jumping off the Himalayan mountains. Certainly science, when drones were new, and they were still very fresh and cool, we flew that into a, a fissure of a volcano in Iceland. And then here at Victoria Falls, just before the pandemic, um, where we were telling a story about drought, but also extensive change to the folks in the villages that lived along the river next to Victoria Falls. So science is the answer. And that's the thing, is I asked myself, that's me, <laughs> a face that only my mother could love, I'm sure. <laughs> How did that become the first female chief meteorologist at a network? How in the world did this young woman with her clear braces, just across the lake from you, uh, how did she get to play Celebrity Jeopardy? How did that bold fashion diva on the left, <laughs> who had the lace socks, yeah? yeah? 90s, early 90s, late 80s, I don't know, we always got things later, you get that too. Uh, how, did, how did that girl with her best friend, Jenny, the blonde on the left, get a new friend? on her left. It's Taylor Swift for anybody that didn't have lace socks. She's my best friend in my head. I've met her like three times. She definitely knows my name. Uh, how did I get a chance to ring in the new year with Ryan Seacrest or hang out with people like Katy Perry, who is so strong, by the way. She picks me up a lot. She's very, very strong. To be able to stand on a red carpet and hang out with Elmo, this one hits at the schools, you can imagine. <laughs> Kiss Kermit. Sorry, Ms. Piggy. How did I get a chance to interview former presidents, big heads of state, people who make big, big changes in our world? How did that awkward young woman, again with the shoe wear, and like, <laughs> did my feet get smaller since then? Or I just filled in, okay. Uh, how did she get a chance to dance with the stars and do a tango with a man named Valentin Schmierkowski and Pasa Doble in front of America every Monday night? It was science. Now that science and the ability to communicate science has shifted into a new part of my life. I wouldn't be here because you all wanted to learn about those things. They're fun. But I'm here because I realized along the way there was me in a natural disaster, and then there was me as a natural disaster. <laughs> My husband has a whole file of these photos. <laughs> I saw some nodding. Your, your husband has them, too. I know. You know what you do? You show them to lots of people, and then he can never do anything with them. <laughs> Good luck to him. It's why I wrote a book about it. It was the easiest title to write, Natural Disaster, I cover them, I am one. Because as I was going through and seeing and being the first person that a lot of people saw when their lives were literally flipped upside down, I realized that I had a whole disaster happening inside of myself and one that I wasn't ready to show everyone. And that is what started the pain. And that's why I'm here today. So let's start at the beginning. A little bit cuter photo, right? <laughs> Uh, I was born in Southern California uh, in a place called Orange, and I'm really lucky that we moved to West Michigan, because without moving to West Michigan, you know we wouldn't have seen weather. How was I going to fall in love with weather in Southern California? Wouldn't have happened. Gratitude, see? <laughs> I mean, I love Southern California. What were they doing? <laughs> but. There they were. We had the, the four-person family, and then, like so many families, we ended up having dad's house and mom's house. And then my mom started dating our dentist. And now this is only important to the story because our dentist, well, we got great dental care, obviously. Um, but also, this dude had dentist money. So like, I got to you know, grow up in Grand Rapids, and I had been to Lake Michigan, but I had never been to one of those places on Lake Michigan let alone on Lake Michigan for the entire summer, he had a place. He called it a cottage. It was not a cottage. <laughs> it was like a palace. And we got to spend that whole summer on that palace deck. 
There's my grandmother, my cousins, my brother, and I. We really took over. They didn't end up getting married. He left her a week before the wedding. It's a wreck, but all better now because I got to see storms. For the first time, I was able to see forever and ever. In Grand Rapids, there were buildings and trees in the way, and I had noticed them, and like a kid that's usually pretty interested in thunder and lightning, sure. But now I had this blank canvas, this full open horizon, and I was able to see thunderstorms coming across the lake, and sometimes they wouldn't hit us, and sometimes they would hit us really hard, and sometimes they would look like they were gonna hit us, and then the rain would dry up. And I realized right then, this is a puzzle. I wanna put that puzzle together. And that's when the little spark went off and the meteorologist was born. We also saw water spouts. If that doesn't lock you in to being a meteorologist, I don't know what will. <laughs> I found them so fascinating. And other than that, I think I was a pretty normal kid. I played soccer, I did competitive cheerleading, but I will tell you, my head was always in the clouds. It still is. Every time I walk outdoors, it doesn't matter how much I've looked at my computer modeling, I will always look up and check out the puzzle piece. And then this happened. If you haven't seen my, me do my job, it's like this. And it is going over Wisconsin, so you know where you are here. We don't have to place it. Uh, but this is 1998, so there is this mass of thunderstorms that then just bows out over Lake Michigan, and the nose of it plows through Grand Rapids. That brought with it, it was a derecho, that's the name of the type of storm, that brought with it 130 mile per hour winds. I was a junior in high school. People were killed, people were injured. It was incredibly devastating, but also for me, who had loved weather this whole time, it was a connector. It was now a realization that this matters. It hurts people, it can change people, and I was able to see the coverage. It also had taken out our movie theater, the one where I had just seen this. <laughs> now if that doesn't make you a meteorologist, <laughs> I don't know what will. When I saw Joe, Helen Hunt, standing on the top of that storm chasing vehicle, I was like, that's it. Thank you, Helen Hunt. Now I know what I want to do with my life. I dedicated myself to saying I'm going to find a college where I can go chase tornadoes. And that's exactly what I did. I graduated high school, still friends with all those ladies. Isn't that the best blessing? Um, and then I regrettably wore this uh, <laughs> at a place called Valparaiso University in Indiana. Um, I went there because they had tornado chasing as an actual course. You get three credits for going for 10 days and chasing tornadoes, and then you have day chases and all this amazing things. So I got a Bachelor of Science in Meteorology and had minors in math and Spanish, and I did not have any intention on getting into TV because that's not what Helen Hunt did. <laughs> so I just wanted to go work for a university and do research until this guy came in, and I always have to give props to the people who, who changed my life. His name is John Knox. He's a professor of meteorology now in Georgia. But he said, I really think you should check out communicating this science. Still stick with the science part of it, learn that, but I think you should check out broadcasting. And I did. I got an internship with this guy. His name is James Spann. He's a weather king in our industry. And then I wanted to be like James Spann and Helen Hunt had a baby. And that's <laughs> kind of what I became, which is pretty exciting. Anybody from Chicago knows Tom Skilling? Yeah, I had uh, an internship with him and another one with a guy named Peter Chan, and I came out of that university saying, look at me. I was feeling myself. I had been working at a PBS station uh, for two years. I had been uh, three internships, and I really felt confident. I sent out 90 VHS tapes. <laughs> Anybody that didn't have lace socks, are you familiar with uh, VHS? <laughs> it's like... Um, a DV no, DVD doesn't work anymore. It's like a, it's how we presented ourselves in a video form back then. I sent out 90 of them. I got zero responses. For a year, I got zero responses, probably because I included that photo. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. Um, but it is the first time that I remember in my life feeling a lot of, I had had down days like everybody does, but it was the first time I had really felt what I think went from down to feeling despair. Some of that had to do with being diagnosed with narcolepsy. And my new doctor had put me on a medication. And everything was amplified. 
the highs were high and the lows were very low. After all of that rejection, some pretty serious boy trouble, uh, some trauma, I tried to take my own life. And I can stand up here and change the mood really, really drastically and quickly because this is why I'm lucky to be here. It's now my responsibility to tell you about these things and to tell you about the journey that happened after because this is not something that doesn't happen every single day, every minute, not just in this country, but around the world. And of course, after I got home from the hospital and they saved my life and I was, for the first 24 hours, I don't know that I was pleased. I think I was, I just felt horrible. I felt horrible that it, about all of it. And then the next day, I couldn't believe that I had done that. And I was like, let's go ahead and pretend that didn't happen. Within a week, I finally got a call for my first job at the X-Files. Not really. It's, uh, <laughs> it was uh, W-E-Y-I, uh, Flint, Michigan. But it looks like the X-Files, doesn't it? <laughs> so weird. Um, my husband also says it looks a lot like the lady at the dry cleaner. <laughs> but that first job allowed me to not only just walk away from what had just happened, but like sprint away. I was like, I don't know who that was. I don't know that life, but I'm on my own. I'm on my way now. And I think most people, and I just didn't know at the time, you can't do that. You can't have major trauma like I lived through. You can't have some serious medication issues going on and then just get better. You have to have help. I wish I would have known that. And I look at the photo that's on the screen now and I get, I, it hurts. That smile, the bigger the smile got, the worse off I was. And in that first job, I tried my best. But I tried other times to take my life. And I never, ever got the help that I needed until much later. I just kept growing and I kept running. And my career kept providing those places to run. I got my next job in Grand Rapids, Michigan, right where I grew up. What a dream. I covered my first storm, Hurricane Katrina, which is quite the first storm to cover. Um, and I went from having such a passion for the science, I got down there, I was so, oh, I wonder what the water line looks like when the surge is 22, 23 feet. And then within 30 seconds, I was like, oh, this is not about science, this is about people. It's where my passion met compassion and humanity. And in those moments, I remember thinking, wow, I am grateful to be here, and I'm gra oh, this is wild, but I didn't take the lessons. I, I wasn't ready to take the lessons that these disasters had shown me yet. I then got a job in Chicago. I started moonlighting at MSNBC. My career was just going wild. But my mental health, I mean, if this doesn't tell you you're a nerd when you make a graph about your life, <laughs> I don't know what does. And that's when I was in an abusive relationship. I was in, there was a lot of other things. I'm speeding through because we only have so much time together. I finally, after all of that, and probably almost a decade of really getting close to not being able to have these opportunities that I have since and have this opportunity just to be in front of all of you, I finally saw a moment, a glimpse, or a glimmer of light, and I finally checked myself in. I was afraid of myself, I was afraid of my abuser, and the hospital felt like the only place that I could go. So 10 days before I started my job at ABC, before I did all those crazy cool things that you just saw, I went to a psych ward. Now we're all getting better about saying like, I, I suffer with depression or I have anxiety. That's, we're getting better about that, right? The moment I say I went to a psych ward, people are like, whoop a doo <laughs> Still, certainly still has a stigma. But I'm here to tell you that that stay, that inpatient therapy, that correct diagnosis, and then what I got to do after and where I am today, has allowed me to heal, to be the absolute best version of myself, and to be able to be here with all of you. So I think I'm in part here also to say, hospitals are good. Getting help is great. If someone's leg is shattered on the side of the road, we don't think twice about it. We pick them up, we help them get to the hospital. When someone's brain has a shattered moment, we all kind of freeze. A lot of us do. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to help them. It doesn't look like a shattered leg, so we're not sure. 
I do think, and in many communities it's different, and I don't know what you all have set up here, but sometimes that is the safest, best first place. For me it was, and it allowed me to work with someone who I had only dreamed of, Diane Sawyer. She was part of that light that I had seen, because I kept thinking in my worst places, and I'd found myself at times, one time in that abusive relationship, having to call the police to help get me out. I thought, well, Diane Sawyer doesn't want that girl who's in a police car getting helped out of a situation. I don't think she wants her on her broadcast. That might be a little dicey. The beauty is, Diane knows this now. And I think she would have. I think we're all, we all have things. We all have a story. And the most important part is to help ourselves to get to the, to the healing point, or at least to the point of maintaining healing sooner. So, boy, am I lucky and grateful that I get to be on GMA every morning and World News Tonight, many nights. I am committed to therapy, and it's the right kind of therapy. You know there are so many different types. And a lot of times we don't either have access to that therapy, people really don't. They don't have the financial ability. And this is something I'd love to be and make a movement to be more accessible. Because I realize I am privileged to have even had access to a wonderful psych ward. Believe me, it's not Club Med, it was not fun. Uh, but to one that could help me. I am honest with myself, which is the primary thing that's changed my life. And that allows me to be honest with other people. And I use something called the fence every day. And it's something I, I know you probably kind of understand, but is anybody in here kind of an empath absorber of other people's feelings? Does it happen a lot? It's very normal, so it's okay to like short raise your hand a little bit. <laughs> I definitely grew up, if someone else was angry, frustrated, sad, especially negative emotion, but even positive emotion, I would somehow get wrapped right into what they were feeling, sometimes even think it was my fault when it had nothing to do with me, and then it, it would impact my own emotional well-being. I didn't know how to regulate that. So I've developed something I call the fence. As soon as somebody is having that moment over there, I put up an invisible fence, only for me to see. I can be empathetic and reach over and say, do you need help? Can I help you? Can I, if I am responsible, I need to remedy that. But I also can keep my emotions safe and helpful on my side of the fence. I actually thank social media a lot for this because it's where I learned it first. One of my favorites. Um, I wish they would replace you with someone else. You are so annoying to watch. <laughs> I've been watching GMA for several years until they put you on. Me and my husband can't not stand it now that you're always grammar. Now that you're on there and that bites because we love Robin and everyone else. Please find another career. You act and seem so fake. Fence. You know? Is Deanna in here? One of these days I'd love to see Deanna because it's just... <laughs> Show yourself, Deanna. But really, if you think about what social media, you know, the negatives of it, I think it really did teach me, this is one of my favorites, has the personality of drizzle, boring and annoying. It's such a good use of Twitter. Um, <laughs> I do like unique responses. Uh, also, if I say thanks for watching, it's usually with a wink. Um, bless your heart. Um, but it really does work. It taught me how to do that and how to, how, how to start to have a, self, a sense of identity before I learned that in therapy, because I had to. I had to put the fence up for these people. Then I realized I could do that in my own life. Of course, my husband, I'm not going to tell him thanks for watching, but <laughs> sometimes he deserves a thanks for watching. Like, <laughs> And then I do the checklist. Again, I'm not breaking news here, but it is a good reminder, especially, well, any time in your life. I use this thing a dozen or more times a day. If I get an emotion that seems too much and I'm like, man, am I mad or jealous or frustrated, I ask myself if I'm gonna remember it next week. I mean, last time that you stayed awake, couldn't fall asleep because you were thinking about something, do you remember what that thing was? We do it to ourselves all the time. I don't know about you, but my memory is not great. And that's part of it. Now, if something's really an actual trauma or something that actually matters in life, of course we're going to remember. Of course we should put energy to it. But a lot of things that we do that with, they don't fit this checklist. If it's not going to matter a year from now, I'm not going to put, I'm going to say, okay, well, that sucks, and then move on. 
And with natural disasters, I started taking notes. And this is something I hope you can glean from me, because not everybody has this opportunity to be the first one there. Natural disasters are trauma, obviously. People lose their homes, they lose their neighbors, they lose their family members. It is incredibly traumatic. But do you know that every single one I've gone to, the hundreds I've gone to, doesn't matter what type it is, a tornado or a flash flood or a hurricane, doesn't matter, people act the same. They all process that trauma the same. In almost the same amount of time, it's really interesting because grief doesn't work like that because everybody other, other grief doesn't work like that because the situations are different. But in this type of trauma, it works because it's visible. Everybody knows because the house is gone that you had a trauma. So you can't run from it. People process it instead of avoiding it. Then their neighbor also lost their house. So they create a community. There's no, oh, silently, yeah, and then like 10 years later, you're like, yeah, I actually lost my house one day. No, you're dealing with it right there together, and you're sharing how to get through it together. And they're giving grace to first responders, to their other neighbors, to their other family members. When, when we have that line in news that is so cliche, like then the community came together, that's because it's true. <laughs> People really do show up. And if we did that with our personal traumas and our mental health issues, if we were more open, visible, and then community-based, I think we could really make it a long way. The isolation and silo, that's not gonna get us anywhere. So I found myself really feeling myself again. I was like, my identity is fusing. I'm doing speeches, I'm going around talking to people, and then I'm in my basement doing the weather because we got a pandemic. <laughs> And now I'm like, OK, so my boys are home, and we adopted a dog, because that's what you're supposed to do. We actually adopted two by the time it was over. We, we did experiments together. I cooked with friends on Instagram. Uh, I wrote more children's books. I made a lot of banana bread. Um, and then I kept doing more weather from the basement. And then I felt like this, like so many of us did. And I woke up for the first time since my awakening of healing, and I was like, it's not that the shutters have closed all the way like they used to, but it's looking gray. I was introduced to anxiety. Like, I'm a very good depressed person. I know how to do depression now. I've been trained in it. I have a whole team for it. Anxiety is not the same. Welcome to a pandemic. I was like, wow, some of the tools are similar, but I had to start working again. And that's the lesson I learned from it. This doesn't just end. This is a constant throughout life change. It's just like physical wellness. I can't go get in sick shape and get a personal trainer and eat right for six months and then stop and everything stays the same. You can't do that with your mental health either. And so that is what I took from the pandemic because all I wanted to do was sit on my back on my porch and drink an entire bottle of wine and be like, I, I don't know, I just wanted my vices and all those things. But finally I had the, the framework and the tools to start. And I go back to this, which people have seen the entire pandemic, but I think it's important every day because I often would be like, oh, poor you in your carpeted basement with a movie room. <laughs> <laughs> but we are not we are all in a storm. You're allowed to be in that storm. We're just not in the same boat. And that's OK to know and say. So here's what I've been doing more. Meditation is real. There's a reason it's been around forever. Um, I write gratitude, what I'm grateful for, every morning on my shower in the steam. And then on the other door, I write my intention for the day. And I come back to both of those things as much as I can throughout the day to help ground me. I have turned my therapist into my personal trainer. I will not miss one of his sessions. It's the most important. It's where I put my time, my energy, my money, everything that I possibly can into making my mental health come first. So I carve out time for that before I even do physical. And then I know my triggers. Transition is tough for me. I know that. So I'm ready for it. I tell my team, my team, my mom, my husband, my therapist, a couple of great friends. I reach out to all of them when something like that happens. I wrote this other book because I wanted to go into that trauma and the maintenance of healing, something that we have to talk more about. Because I want everybody to find what I have found. And that's not happiness. 
I don't pursue happiness anymore. Happiness is transient. I've been happy like eight times today, but I've also been pissed off and I've also been excited and I've also been <laughs> sad and that's life. I pursue peace with those things. The pursuit of peace. And I think we all know we deserve it. I hope we all know we deserve it. Because I have peace and I am and grateful. Every time that sun hits me, I take it in. I bask in it. But I realize it's not always there. I'm going to try all the things that scare me, because there are things, like driving, that scares me. I still go to those storms, and I try to pick up as much as I can from them, share with them, and, and move on from them, and help them move on. But I also always remember, because I've seen it, I've lived it, that storms and clouds don't last forever. It's not how the atmosphere works, and it's not how life works. Thank you all so much for having me. Those are my books. I wrote some children's books, too. And that's where you can find them. Thank you. Thank you.